Hey guys, Steve here, and last time we trekked through Pokemon Blue with Polygon the Porygon. Porygon landed itself in the A tier of my list here with a final time of 113 real time, 423 game time, at level 59 with 12 resets. This run is going to be Beedrill. Yes, that's right, everyone's favorite needly boy. Beedrill has base stats totaling 350 and 5 weaknesses in Flying, Fire, Psychic, Bug, and Rock. Beedrill doesn't get a lot of love. But its stats are actually quite good. 80 attack at 75 speed means I'll get to go first quite often, and I'll hit hard, giving me the chance to one-shot a lot. The learn set is quite strong too, as Beedrill gets the best bug move in the game in Twin Needle, and it's the only one that learns it. Beedrill also benefits quite a lot from Swords Dance as well, so the world opens up as soon as we get past Rock Tunnel. As always, my solo runs will be using the Gen 1 Blue version, with the Pokemon selected from the comment section of my previous video. If there aren't enough comments, I'll be using a Pokemon selected at random. I'll be playing with the same rules as I always do, but I have to add one to the list as it was brought up while I was practicing. I'll only be allowed to use one Pokemon. The other Pokemon will be there for HM purposes only and not be allowed to use in battle. No glitches or exploits except the badge boost glitch and Marowak skip. No items used within battle. No losing of any kind. This means I cannot black out train. Lastly, no using double team until the run seems absolutely hopeless. With every video, my routing and skills at Pokemon get better but I will still make plenty of mistakes. I've decided that since I do three practice runs leading up to this run, I will highlight the things I learned from those runs at the end of the video. I also want to include a new section before I start the run, where I give a Pokemon creator I like watching a shout out. Today's creator is Andrew Davis. Here's a short little clip of something from his channel I absolutely loved. Did you know that Miltank can learn Surf in this game? I mean, I didn't teach it, but it gives a whole new meaning to the term Cowabunga! So stay tuned past the choosing of the next Pokemon if you want to see the struggles I had to endure to obtain the knowledge of this video. I am writing the script after the run. Please try and guess in the comment section how quickly I'll be able to beat the game and how well you think it may perform in certain areas of the game. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay updated on future videos. First off, we're going to start the game by grabbing our level 5 Beedrill and replacing Bulbasaur with the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to make sure Champ has a Charizard. In order to increase the difficulty, I have decided to start with Beedrill and not Weedle, losing access to Poison Sting and Harden. I give it the nickname Bumblebee, as this is the name that best suits it. I make sure to pause the game and reset Beedrill's stats to give it perfect DBs before starting. We start off our first Champ battle with Fury Attack, and we continue to follow up with more Fury Attacks, until we eventually win. I head straight to Pewter City, only battling the trainer with the level 9 Weedle on the way. This gives me access to the closer Pokemon Center as early as possible since I will need to do loads of training. I learned from my practice run that Beedrill just can't beat Brock without some crazy luck. Also, if you beat Brock at a lower level, many of the more difficult battles take an extra turn or two, and with our defenses, we just can't afford that. Eventually, at level 16, I decide that Champ 1A should be some easy XP, and I make my way towards him. This battle isn't particularly hard, but it's very comical just how many misses I get. I enter the battle with 13 Fury attacks, and the win was never really in doubt until the end here, when there's a very good chance I actually run out of PP. Anyways, after nearly 31 minutes of straight training, I finally achieve level 20, and this Brock battle goes from lying on luck to quite easy. Geodude takes two uses of Twin Needle. Onyx also goes down after just two uses of Twin Needle as well, obtaining the Boulder Badge. Being as overleveled as we are at this point, and with the best bug move in the game, we make quick work through the trainers on Route 3 with ease. We make our way to the fossil section, and I decide to show my praise toward Lord Helix as I grab the Helix fossil. With a level advantage, I decide that Misty will probably be the best choice heading into Cerulean. As Staryu comes out, it becomes clear to me that Bug must not be super effective against water, as Staryu takes two attacks to go down. Next up is Starmie, and with Psychic being weak to Bug, this should be an easy battle. Unfortunately for me, Starmie has some pretty solid defense, but with an X speed and a tackle, Starmie doesn't seem to be putting his best foot forward and earns us the Cascade Badge. Champ 2 is next, and from the test runs there's no real strategy in this one. We have an 85% accurate, low power move, and he has a sand slinging bird. This battle is no better than a coin flip. Pidgeotto comes out and we spam Fury Attack. As he goes for Gust and two quick attacks, the coin flip goes our way this time and we make our way to Abra without any sand attacks on us. Abra and Rattata are but one twin needle to take care of them. Charmander is a different story. Even though fire resists bug, I go for twin needle because of the 100% accuracy and the guarantee of 50 power. Fury attack is only 85% accurate and does 15 power per hit, 
most often hitting only twice. At this point, we're quite a bit overleveled, and Nugget Bridge isn't of too much difficulty. Without the need of Body Slam, we head directly to Champ 3. As this battle begins, notice anything different? I actually managed to start it with Potion this time. With only two gusts, Pidgeotto goes down rather easily. This battle really highlights just how useless Fury Attack really is. Raticate and Kadabra don't put up much of a fight thanks to our superb speed. Next up is Charmeleon, and our first attack is Fury Attack, and it only hits twice, and he retaliates with a critical hit, Ember. Without that Super Potion, this would have been the end. I cannot afford a miss, so I switch to a more accurate Twin Needle, and fingers crossed we live through the next Ember. We live through, and thanks to no sand attacks, Charmeleon is as good as gone. At this point, it feels like in all of my runs, I'm obligated to try and skip the Pokemon Center in Vermilion so I can dig back to Cerulean after Surge. We can pick up an Ether right next to Bill's house and buy some Super Potions with the repels for Rock Tunnel. So, it is manageable with most Pokemon. We make our way through the trash can puzzle and battle Surge. Guess what? I remembered heal again! Learning takes time, guys. Anyways, Voltorb and Pikachu go down to a single Twin Needle because of their very poor defense. Raichu is just too used as a Twin Needle, and judging by that Thunder Shot, Thunderbolt wouldn't have done much to us anyways. I can't complain, Surge is usually one of the more inconsistent battles of the runs, getting ourselves the Thunder Badge. At this point, I feel I'm obligated to show just how the Exploding Hiker battle goes in Rock Tunnel. The first Geodude comes out, and we unfortunately cannot take it out in one hit. He goes for a self-destruct, and it appears we will probably have to reset and get a better roll of the dice. The next Geodude takes a Twin Needle and then misses with a Tackle, taking us to Graveler. Our first Twin Needle does a little bit more than half. Well, now it's a 1 in 4 chance we'll make it past the Hiker, I guess. Wow, Bumblebee can take a hit, better than I thought. I don't know what to chalk this victory up to. We don't resist normal moves, Bumblebee has quite literally no defense. I guess it must be the weak attack stat from Graveler. We make our way directly to Erika's gym, but I need to be aware that most of the Pokemon know Poison Powder and Stun Spore thanks to the Porygon run. However, due to a Gen 1 mechanic, you cannot be hit by a status effect that matches your typing, so our Poison type Beedrill cannot be poisoned. Unlike Porygon, Beedrill is some mad speed, and none of the Pokemon really get to hit us a single time, and with a strong bug move on our side, they all go down quite easily. As the Erika battle begins, you can see that Beedrill's speed allows it to go first against Victory Bell, which was the major threat on our team. Both Tangela and Vileplume don't really stand much of a chance to Twin Needle either, and we get ourselves the Rainbow Badge. After a quick shopping trip, we grab Fly and head directly to Lavender Town. But before I battle Champ, I make sure to pick up Swift, as it's 100% accurate and just as good as 4 Fury attacks. On to Champ 4 and Pidgeotto comes out, and we start to see just how strong our Swift really is. After a Whirlwind, we make it through Pidgeotto with no problems. Execute is next, and it goes down to a single Twin Needle hit, as it's four times effective. Our biggest obstacle is next, in Gyarados, and Swift was the real answer we needed all this time, and we do a little bit more than half. We take a pretty decent Hydra Pump, but that's about it for Gyarados. Kadabra is easily taken care of with Twin Needle, and the biggest challenge is Charmeleon. Again, Swift does a little bit more than half, and one Ember later we get through Champ. I can't tell you how many times I tried this battle in earlier runs with Fury Attack, and Swift was right there under my nose the entire time. After a quick pit stop to grab Sword Dance and Silphco, we head to the Cycling Road and then the Safari Zone to get Surf, making sure to pick up all the vitamins along the way. Koga's trainers are quite easy, except for the ones that have Sand Slash. Koga has been a roadblock in most of the practice runs, so I try and make sure that I arrive at as high a level as possible. The Koga battle begins, and we set up with three Swords Dance, and an agility to make sure that we can one-hit his entire team up to Weezing. As Muck comes out, the worst kind of situation happens, and we get a crit, and he uses Sludge. The next Swift takes it down, and the coughing is out next, but it's really unlucky not to have the Muck just use Minimize or Disable. Unfortunately for me, the Weezing battle is basically the same as the Exploding Hiker. I cannot take it out in one hit, and a self-destruct will. Weezing uses self-destruct, and we take our first reset of the run. Unfortunately for me, the next attempt goes almost exactly the same way, so I speed right through it to attempt number three. At this point, I'm quite annoyed at the luck not going our way, so I take luck into my own hands. The coughing and muck never really seem to do a whole lot of damage to Bumblebee, so I decide to set up our swords dance on coughing and spam swift until I level up. At this point, I use the last two swords dance and all three agility in hopes that we get just enough attack to take out Weezing in one hit. The deciding moment comes up, and it goes down. 
getting ourselves the Soul Badge. If I were to have done a 5th run, this is the spot I would try to get a consistent improvement upon. Next up, we work our way to Self Code, Battle Champ. As the champ battle begins, we start off with one sword stance and use Swift to get us through Pidgeot. As Execute comes out, you get to see the reason why I didn't heal or set up any other status moves. Execute has Reflect, which is considered a psychic move, and therefore he will just spam it forever. This allows me to get in the rest of my sword stance and agility in. I also won't need to worry about a level up because of the frailness of Champ's Pokemon. I then proceed to knock out Gyarados, Alakazam, and Charizard using my upgraded attack and speed. We then make our way to Giovanni with pretty low HP, but it was never really all that worried. We set up our three sword stance on Nidorino, knowing we already outspeed his entire team. I proceed to one-shot the Nidorino with Twin Needle. With Kangaskhan, I had to do a bit of thinking as Twin Needle and Swift were both one times effective against it, but Swift does 60 base power, so I use that attack. Knowing that Rock resists Swift, I make sure to use Twin Needle on Rhyhorn, and Little Queen is weak to bug. As we make our way to Sabrina, I learned from my previous run that it's better to train off her trainers rather than the cycling road bikers. Just about every trainer is psychic or poison type in some way, making them easy to deal with, and none of them can really one-shot Bumblebee. However, the third trainer here survives a single Twin Needle and puts us to sleep, in which we never wake up. The next time, I make it through all the trainers without any issues and heal up to replenish our PP. As Sabrina gets started, you can see the reason I really wanted to get all of this extra training in. The Kadabra is really high speed and we need to take it out in one hit, which we do. This allows me to easily set up on Mr. Mime. Mr. Mime typically starts with a barrier in a light screen before using Confusion, but today it seems a bit more bold starting with a Confusion. I tempt fate and try and get a second sword stance to make me feel a lot more confident that I will outspeed the Alakazam. The extra badge boost helps, as we are able to outspeed. Luckily, she sets up a light screen, and this provides us the extra turn we need to finish it off. At this point, I should be good to finish off the rest of her team. The badge boost from sword stance is enough to allow us to move first, and I take out the Alakazam for the win, earning us the Marsh Badge. For those of you who do not know how badge boosting works, any times a status move happens, whether it be good or bad, will improve any stat we currently have an odd numbered badge for by 12.5%. Nothing out of the ordinary happens at Pokemon Mansion other than grabbing all the vitamins to sell for later. This brings us to Blame, which is typically a roadblock based on wherever we level up. I set up three Sword Stance and one Agility, saving the other two for later, as we get through Growlithe relatively unscathed. Ponyta then also goes down in one hit. Rapidash would have gone down in one hit if it weren't for a critical hit, but it's okay, as he only uses Fire Spin and we outspeed getting to go next. Thanks to no level up, we're able to take down Arcanine in a single hit as well, earning us the Volcano Badge. After this intense battle, we're not going to heal, and instead we're going to teach Mega Drain over Agility because our next battle is against a Rhyhorn. Well, it's finally time to cash in all those vitamins and TMs from earlier in the run, and we head to the game corner to start purchasing coins. Let's show just how long it takes to purchase 5,500 coins. Our first purchase is at 1 hour 17 minutes and 2 seconds, and our last purchase is at 1 hour 19 minutes and 27 seconds, so this is a large time commitment. Because there's the chance Hyper Beam can miss, I need to grab an extra PP up to ensure that I can sweep through Lance's entire team later on in the run. Giovanni's next, and he starts off with a Rhyhorn. Rhyhorn is a good setup target with a terrible moveset, so I get in my three sword stance and proceed to Mega Drain it. Then, Dugtrio, Nidoqueen, and Nidoking all go down to a single Hyper Beam. Rhydon hangs on with about half health from the Mega Drain, and then wastes a Horn Drill, and he goes down the next turn, earning us the Earth Badge. We make our way to Champ 6, but I decide to use a Rare Candy to make sure I don't level up. Through my testing, I cannot take a hit from Alakazam, but without agility, I need to make sure this doesn't happen. Pidgeot comes out, and we're fine taking a hit to set up Sword Stance. A Hyper Beam takes care of it the next turn. Next up is Rhyhorn, and it's not really a threat of any sort, so we finish setting up here. One Mega Drain then takes care of it, and any damage either Pidgeot or Rhyhorn would have done to us. Execute, Gyarados, and Alakazam are all one-shots with Twin Needle, Hyper Beam, and another Hyper Beam respectively. Charizard is next, and this is basically in the bag, just another Hyper Beam. We take a miss and go down to 14 for full HP. Jeez, was that close. We then use another Hyper Beam and what? A miss? And Charizard battles back with another flamethrower? Well, I guess the run needed something to happen. It was going way too well. 
Next run is the same all the way up to Charizard, so we'll just go ahead and speed up the footage to get us to Charizard. With full HP once again, we already know that we can survive a flamethrower with enough HP to be out of any sort of range. That shouldn't even matter, because it should just go down to one shot anyways. Charizard comes out, and we use Hyper Beam, and we crit. Whatever, let's take our hit and move on. Flamethrower crit? Okay, sure. How are we gonna lose this next one? Everything up to Charizard is consistent once again, taking a bit of extra damage from Rhyhorn's stop, and that 6 HP probably won't matter. Charizard comes out, and the most likely scenario happens. One shot. Well, hopefully we're due some luck in the league now that we've used up all of our bad luck. Nothing out of the ordinary happens at Victory Road, except that while I'm prepping for the Elite Four, I use a rare candy on Lapras. This normally wouldn't be any sort of big deal because I don't use all of them, but it then attempts to learn Sing, and I have to fiddle through the text to make sure I don't learn it. We make our way to Lorelei, and it shouldn't be much of an issue. I basically solved the strategy for her on run number two. We start out with a Dugong, which loves using itself some rest when you're a poison type. So, I use Twin Needle, not with the intention of taking out the Dugong, but forcing her into using Rest, while I use my three sword stance. I do this twice, and then a Hyper Beam takes it to Super Potion range, in which another Hyper Beam takes it out. Cloyster, Slowbro, and Jinx then proceed to be taken out with one Hyper Beam each, taking us to Lapras. Hyper Beam gets a critical hit, and we're a sitting duck for two turns. Lapras does its very best with a Body Slam and a Hydro Pump, but they're not enough to finish us off and we skate our way to Bruno. Bruno is once again not worth my time, and I'm just speaking words right now so you can hear how easy it was to set up some sword stance and one-shot every Pokemon in his team, finishing with full HP. As most probably know, Agatha is quite a trainer to put it lightly. We set up two sword stance and are at her will as she proceeds to set up Nightshade, and we miss a Hypnosis. The following turn, we're able to use our Twin Needle, and Gengar goes down. Unsurprisingly, the Golbat goes down next to another use of Twin Needle. If we were able to take out the Gengar before, the Haunter shouldn't be a problem with a Twin Needle. The Arbok never seems to be a problem, and it goes down to one use of Twin Needle as well. It's time for the scariest Pokemon on our team, the level 60 Gengar. We're able to finally outspeed the Gengar and take it out with a single use of Twin Needle, which must have been a range. After the one of the best runs we've ever had here on the channel, can our Bumblebee really make it past Lance in a single try too? Gyarados comes out, and I know from our testing that we need to set up two Sword Dance and cross our fingers as he doesn't use two high damaging moves. These moves are Hydro Pump or a second turn Hyper Beam. After a Dragon Rage and a Leer, we are ready to sweep through the rest of his team no problem. We use a Hyper Beam and another Crit, and Gyarados uses a Hyper Beam and it ends our beautiful first run. I guess it turns out the thing I shouldn't be worried about is the 10% chance to miss, but actually the 15% chance to crit. On our very next attempt, Gyarados decides to use Hyper Beam first, and this allows us enough time to use two Swords Dance once again. We use our Hyper Beam and take it down. Next up is Dragonair. We can easily take it out with a Hyper Beam, but just in case I get another crit on Aerodactyl, I make sure to use up all of the Mega Drains first. Then, both Dragonairs go down to a single Hyper Beam each. The Aerodactyl comes out, and it turns out we didn't need to use all those Mega Drains, as we didn't manage to crit it, and it goes down in a single hit. Just a Dragonite left, and this one is won. Unfortunately, we crit on the very next Hyper Beam, and our victory is delayed. We make our way to Champ next, and he's improved a lot since last we saw him. But will he be enough to take out our Mighty B? We start off the battle with a single Sword Stance, and with a mirror move by Pidgeot, we are free to swap. Pidgeot then goes down to a single Hyper Beam. The next Alakazam is able to be outsped, and one Hyper Beam drops it as well. At this point, we're free to finish our setup and heal any damage Pidgeot might have done to us on Rhyhorn. Executor is next, and we get our first miss from Hyper Beam, and it's a devastating one, as he manages to put us to sleep. Quite a few barrage hits and stomps later, and we wake up and hit it with a Hyper Beam to take us to Gyarados. Unlike Lance's Gyarados, we are already set up and just need to use a Hyper Beam to one-shot it. Unfortunately, we get yet another crit. He gives us a Leer, but the next turn he isn't nearly as kind as he takes us out for an unfortunate loss. On the very next attempt, we set up our one Sword Stance and take a Wing Attack. We're then able to get through Pidgeot, and once again, we can get through Alakazam with ease. As Rhydon comes out, I forget to set up and use Mega Drain first and then we proceed to set up and take it out. 
It's not a big deal, just a few HP, but this can't be too bad of a mistake, right? And Secutor doesn't cause any issues as it goes down to a single Hyper Beam. Gyarados goes down the same way. However, this last battle has cost us a level up, and now there's a chance we won't outspeed the Charizard. With just our normal badge boost, 133 times 1.125 equals 149, and that's larger than his 145. And our Hyper Beam goes off first, it doesn't crit, making us the champion of the Pokemon League with just a B. And I even managed to do it under level 65, which is what I expected to do after watching a bunch of YouTubers and from my practice runs. We finished the game at level 59 with 134 real time, 601 game time, and 7 resets. Since I mentioned those other attempts so much, it's only fair that I mention how I did in those attempts. My first attempt I finished at level 62 with 250 real time, 549 game time, and 93 resets. My second attempt I finished at level 56 with 206 real time, 627 game time, and 35 resets. My third attempt I finished at level 59 with 156 real time, 634 game time, and 21 resets. I did get slightly better each time as I figured out better paths, better moves, and where not to pick things up. Beedrill is only my fourth Pokemon to complete the game with, and with a bit of experience under my belt, I can confidently say that it was much worse than Porygon, and a bit better than Butterfree. I'm going to stick it at the top of the B tier for now. Despite having a worse game time than Butterfree, I chalk up a lot of that to the fact that I had to spend some extra time picking up vitamins, as well as buying coins to get Hyper Beam. Beedrill's learn set was pretty well balanced to beat the game since it had the best bug move in the game, but not as good a move set to get past a lot of the key fights that rely on luck. Some of these fights include Rival 2, The Exploding Hiker, Koga, Blaine, and Agatha just to name a few. However, with enough practice I was able to get run number 4 to look rather effortless. No amount of good movesets was going to put Butterfree in the positions that Beedrill found itself in. Thanks to my comment in the last video about leaving a comment to choose the Pokemon in the next run, I was recommended to do Kangaskhan. This one is the most comments, and I have decided that it is next. If you have any suggestions for Pokemon, ways to improve my strategy, maybe even ways to improve my video quality, or just to start a meme like how Scott's Thoughts Chat uses Dennis, feel free to let me know in the comment section below. My channel is always improving, and every video I plan to bring you even better content. Keep the suggestions coming, and I look forward to bringing you another video. If you've stayed past this point of the video, I thank you very much. Over this point of the video, I'd like to go over most of the situations that led to this video's run looking so polished. From the very start with Brock, my first run, I was able to get past Brock at level 14, and this caused many problems throughout the rest of the run. Rival 2 took an extra 4 resets thanks to being underleveled. The Exploding Hiker cost me 6 resets because I couldn't survive 2 self-destructs. I attempted to buy Carbos, like my other run thinking I was so frail I was going to need to make sure I outsped everything. Rival 4 took 3 resets because of the lack of consistency from Fury Attack. After 2 not very close losses at Koga, I learned I couldn't do them right after Cycling Road. After 5 losses, I realized I couldn't take on Rival 5 at level 38 and needed to be a higher level going into this battle. After 7 resets, I learned Rival 6 couldn't be done with Swift, so I obtained and taught Double Edge. This still required some luck as it took 3 more resets before I could get past Rival 6. It took 6 resets to learn the order of moves to use after the Dugong battle, which I did know immediately thanks to Poison Typing. Double Edge didn't one hit most of her Pokemon like Hyper Beam could, so I spent a lot of resets figuring out what balance of Double Edge and Twin Needle to use. For Agatha, it took 12 resets to develop the two Swords Dance strategy to defeat everything except for the last Gengar. Although, in this strategy, I needed to use Double Edge on the Golbat because my level was too low to have a chance at using Twin Needle. After 13 resets, I learned that I should try and grab Mimic to see if I could steal Ice Beam from the second Dragonair. Since I left the Elite Four, I had to battle all of them again and only lost one time on Lorelei getting back to Lance so I was pretty happy with what I discovered thus far. I learned that that Dragonair didn't have Ice Beam. That was a Pokemon Yellow move, and then stole Hyper Beam. This move then proceeded to crush his Pokemon after one Sword Stance setup, and two Double Edges. Then, I would steal Hyper Beam from Dragonair and use it on the rest of his Pokemon. After 14 resets, I realized that I wasn't able to beat the champion at this low level, or without Hyper Beam. So I came back with Hyper Beam, and at level 61 was able to develop the final strategy, which was the same as the fourth attempt, except I was using Mimic to steal Sky Attack for Executor. 
When I started Attempt 2, I decided that level 15 would make Brock considerably easier, until I got there and gave it 6 attempts, and then gave up. I tried again with 3 more resets across level 16, 17, and 18, but it was painfully clear that the move Focus Energy learned at level 16 ruined any chance at Brock until I learned Twin Needle because I can't use Struggle anymore. Rival 3 took 4 resets as I got unlucky with a bunch of sand attacks since I couldn't reliably 2 hit KO the Pidgeotto. After 4 resets, I learned Rival 5 shouldn't be done before Koga. I tried Rival 6 again with Swift, and after 2 resets, I really cemented that I should be buying Hyper Beam. After 5 resets against Lance, I realized just how hopeless I am setting up, and that there's nothing I can do, even with the Hyper Beam strategy, except to make sure that I have 6 Hyper Beams because of a chance of miss. After 4 resets, I learned that Pidgeot doesn't need 2 Swords Dance setups to take it down. From attempt number 3, I learned from my attempts of training in Koga's gym that some of the trainers have Sand Slash with Slash. I learned that I was able to one-shot the champion's executor with Hyper Beam, meaning I didn't need to use Mimic at all. Please let me know if you liked this quick what I learned section. It's a bit quicker than the rest of the video, but I didn't want to leave anyone in the dark on just how I learned these strategies. Thanks everyone, and hopefully I'll see you in two weeks with Tangus gone.